the V4 standalone. Pure awesomeness. 85 megahertz of 080 power, 512 megabytes of RAM, as well as AGA, RTG, and 16-bit audio, all delivered over a single HDMI compatible cable. In the 68K world of Amigas, it doesn't get much better than this. But if only you could insert that into an Amiga 500 or 1200. Well, that's exactly what the Apollo team have done. The Ice Drake and Firebird accelerators are a V4 for your favorite Wedge Amiga. Not only does it deliver the outstanding CPU performance of the Apollo Core, but it delivers AGA, RTG, and eight channels of 16-bit audio from your classic Amiga to modern monitors over a single HDMI compatible cable. It even injects AGA magic into your Amiga 500. But is it worth the upgrade for owners of a V2 accelerator? Just what accessories are worth considering in your build? And can it really turn an Amiga 500 into a 1200? The answer might surprise you. Stick with me as I put the Firebird and Ice Drake up against the V2 1200 and the V4 standalone. So what's new in the V4 compared to the V2? Essentially the Ice Drake and Firebird cards are just a V4 motherboard reforged into an accelerator with similar specs to match. An 85 MHz 080 CPU, 512 MB of RAM, super fast Ethernet, super fast IDE, an SD card slot, and USB ports for connecting the much easier to find USB mice and game controllers. The board also packs some 3D capabilities and the potential for overclocking to 100 MHz, which was demonstrated in a recent firmware update. V2 owners will almost certainly welcome the enhanced video capabilities with RTG and AGA being delivered over HDMI, along with audio. Switching between the modes is automatic, just like on the V4, and there's also the V4's 16-bit 8-channel audio there too. There are also more off-the-shelf accessories this time around. An onboard clock, and this handy backport extender for getting video, Ethernet and USB to the back of the Amiga 1200. These were desperately needed and very slow in coming for the V2. Amiga 500 owners will have to wait until A1200Net ships their long-awaited, revamped A500 case to get all of the Firebird's ports accessible externally. But that's coming now. Installing the accelerators is very different for each card. The Amiga 1200 is designed with accelerators in mind, so the ice drake just slides into place. If you want to use the inbuilt expansion ports, you're going to need to open the case, however. The Apollo Store offers a kit which brings HDMI, USB, Ethernet to the back of the Amiga. The SD card can also be brought to the back using a ribbon cable and one of these 3D printed mounts. Amiga 500 owners are unfortunately stuck with a case design that really expected expansions to be mounted externally. Thankfully, A1200.net have you covered with their series of cases, and these cases will allow HDMI, SD card, Ethernet and USB to be brought tastefully to the side and the back of the case. And I'm really looking forward to getting mine, which sadly didn't arrive in time for this video. Installing the Firebird is a bit more involved. You will need to dismantle the Amiga 500 and remove the CPU. Here I'm reusing the case from my V2 powered Amiga 500, which has holes already for the HDMI and Ethernet. I'll also be using my A500 Plus reproduction board. Installing the card does require some care. The pins of the Firebird are delicate and must line up precisely with the CPU socket. There are these convenient holes here to allow for the capacitors on various 500 models to poke through. Once everything is lined up, apply some pressure to seat the card firmly into the socket. Then it's just a matter of running cables for the USB and HDMI. One thing to note is this jumper here. By bridging these two pins, your Amiga 500 will get an automatic upgrade to AGA at boot time. You could use the vControl command to enable AGA in the startup sequence or even from Workbench. However, a reboot is needed if you enable it from Workbench. The installer for drivers can be found on the Apollo Computing website and contain drivers for the Ethernet, SD card and P96 graphics layer. The USB ports don't need a driver. These are essentially a hardware mapping of USB signals to the Amiga's native mouse and joystick port, so only mice and game controllers will work here. Both cards have two IDE slots, and I have purchased kits from AmigaWorld.de which channels the activity signals from the CF card to the Amiga's LEDs. The Amiga 500 version slots in over the keyboard connector and the activity is shown on the floppy drive LED. 
The A1200 version is similar, but slots into the A1200's LED headers. The iStrike already has pins for ID activity, so we don't need a special CF card adapter here. So how much performance do the new cards pack? The CPU and IDE port on all cards is the same, and as expected, Sysinfo gives the cards roughly the same score, around 162 MIPS and 81 megaflops. The IDE speed is also similar at around 10 megabytes per second for each card, except for the iStreg, which achieves 11 megabytes per second. The real differences start when we look at RAM performance. I have split the chip RAM scores into cards utilizing real chip memory and cards using DDR3. Both the V1200 and iStrake are more or less on par with each other at 7 megabytes per second, as are the Firebird and V4 standalone at 440 and 460 megabytes per second. Now the additional chip RAM speed of the Firebird and V4 standalone does play a role and we'll see that later when we test AGA. FastRAM is similar but not as close as I expected. The V4 cards are very alike with performance being between 440 and 470 megabytes per second. But the V1200 achieves only 291 megabytes per second. If you have a keen eye, you will notice that I have run the benchmark on a screen with a resolution of 1280 by 720. With the frame buffer being in FastRAM, there's a penalty to pay. Dropping the screen resolution to 320 by 240 reveals how much bandwidth is lost to a high resolution. And here's where we see another noticeable difference. The V1200 is paying the highest penalty. At 1280 by 720, the V1200 pays around double the penalty of the V4 cards at 183 megabytes per second of reduced RAM speed. Put simply, the V4 based cards will perform overall better when using high resolution RTG screens. Overclocking the cards to 100 MHz, we see that they now jump to a score of 188 MIPS and 94 megaflops. So what does this extra 20 MIPS of performance give you? Well, that depends on your application, of course. As a quick glimpse, here's PC Task running side by side on an ice drake at 85 MHz and 100 MHz. There is a noticeable difference, but the difference isn't as stark as saying stepping up from an 060 to an 080. Next, we look at networking. Built into each card is a fast Ethernet adapter. And to test this adapter, I'm going to use Apollo Explorer, a file transfer utility I wrote for Apollo OS. This is a simple Amiga server software which sends and receives files from a client running on a PC. For this test, I'm also going to throw in my Amiga 2000 with its XSurf 100 just for comparison. Each of the Amigas is running the TCP Stack Roadshow with the send and receive buffers extended to a size of 64 frames. The test is an upload of a 100 megabyte CDXL file to the RAM disk. So how did each card perform? The V1200 reached an average of 750 kilobytes per second, peaking at 830 kilobytes per second. Next is the Amiga 2000 with its XSurf 100, with a consistent 1.6 megabytes per second. The Firebird delivers a healthy 3.5 megabytes per second, peaking occasionally at 4 megabytes per second. The iStrake is a tad faster with an average of 3.6 megabytes per second and a peak of 4.3 megabytes per second. But the clear winner was the V4 standalone with a blazing 4.5 megabytes per second average and a peak of 5 megabytes per second. Now I thought all cards performed admirably, but I didn't expect the V4 standalone to lead the Firebird and iStrake by nearly 1 megabyte per second. The XSurf result looks a little low to my mind, and I suspect with proper tweaking I would get at least 2 megabytes per second. But its major bottleneck is the Amiga 2000's limited Zorro 2 bandwidth. The V1200's performance is not to be underestimated. For a network adapter that costs around 20 euros, the performance is comparable to the more expensive PCM CIA cards. So how good is the AGA and RTG implementation? Big box Amigas made switching between RTG and AGA painless, 
and until now, that was denied to the Wedge Amiga experience. The V2 was only ever capable of producing RTG modes. Bringing AGA to a modern monitor meant buying a scan doubler, running two cables and switching inputs. The V4 sends both video modes over the same cable and handles switching internally. The transition is effortless and the experience is very pleasurable. Of course, if you're just looking for a pure AGA experience, then you'll be right at home. The V4's AGA experience is as good as, and in some cases better, than the Indivision AGA Mark III. Out of the box, both produce an authentic looking picture, however neither is utilising the screen's full real estate. Now I prefer to run AGA without any scan lines and using the screen's full size. To do this, I add these commands to my startup sequence. Indivision also has a tool for adjusting the screen and you can place it and scale it as you see fit. But there is something a little odd about the screen once the Indivision has scaled it up. The text looks warped and it is sometimes unreadable. Textures also get quite warped. The V4 at full screen is crystal clear and there's no comparison. Just look at these workbench screens side by side. Notice how malformed the text on the Indivision is. The M in system the V in V2, and in fact most of the words in the title bar are misshapen. This isn't particularly good on the Indivision, but something the V4 does very well. However, the V4 doesn't do interlaced modes properly, and this is something that the Indivision can do. Turning our attention briefly to performance, I used the program in TUI Speed to perform some synthetic benchmarks on AGA, and here's where we see something quite interesting. Both the V1200 and Icetrake perform at the top of AGA's expected performance. But the V4 standalone, and more interestingly, the Firebird equipped Amiga 500, outperform them both, and by a considerable margin. And sometimes by a factor of 2 to 10 times. That's right, a Firebird equipped Amiga 500 is up to 10 times the speed of an Amiga 1200 in AGA. That's quite incredible. This is because in AGA mode, the Firebird bypasses the Amiga 500's slow chip RAM and uses the much faster onboard DDR3 RAM. And this is quite visible in real world scenarios. Compare Workbench in AGA screen modes, for example. First, the V1200. Now the Ice Drake. And finally the Firebird. The Firebird is much smoother. Looking briefly at AGA video playback, I'm using the brilliant AGA Blaster utility to playback some CDXL videos. All four machines perform admirably, but the V1200 is a tad slower. If you look carefully enough, you will notice that it isn't as smooth as the V4 based Amigas. It's barely noticeable, but the V1200 is playing at 8 frames per second slower. With the Amiga fired up, it's time to try out some games and see how the system behaves as a whole. When I purchased my Ice Drake, I also bought the recommended USB mouse and joypad. These plug snugly into the Omniport expansion, and I have to say, having USB at the back is very convenient. The USB mouse feels and works just like a native Amiga mouse, and that means it also works in the early boot menu. The joypad is inexpensive and very good. It is easily one of the more comfortable joypads I've used, and works exceptionally well with Amiga games. It also provides signals for all of the buttons normally found on the CD32 controller, and that should make playing CD32 games a simple affair. However, I failed to find a way to test this in-game, or at least the games I tried didn't recognize the extra buttons. I think this is a failure on my part to configure WHD load correctly. Next up, I tried the Uni Joystickle, a wireless receiver for Bluetooth mice and joypads. This just plugs into the back of your Amiga and translates the signals coming from Bluetooth devices to Amiga native mouse and joystick signals. I purchased this SN30 Pro joypad 
and this HP branded mouse from the recommended devices list. Once connected, the joypad and mouse operate like native devices. If you use this on an Amiga 500, you will need to connect additional power to the Uni joystickle. Now in case you're wondering, PCMCAA works well. And I use the Squirrel SCSI controller to play CD-based games such as Arshoot. So here is the gameplay up close. AGA games look and sound fantastic. The AGA implementation of the Ice Drake and Firebird is excellent. I did however have some bugs in some games. Brian the Lion for example normally looks like this on the Ice Drake. However every so often it looked like this. This is just a bug ultimately and will be ironed out in future firmware releases, so stay tuned. So that was my comparison of the V2 and the V4. Uh, I didn't cover every feature of the V4, it doesn't make sense in a V4 versus V2 video because not all features are in the V2. I didn't cover the 8 channels of audio, the 3D and the picture on picture. And the other thing I would really have loved to have done is to have covered the Manticore, that's the V4 accelerator for the Amiga 600. That came a little bit too late for my planning. And the other thing that probably would have been nice is, yeah, the, C the uh, Amiga 500 cases. Uh, that showed up two hours ago, so a little bit too late. But uh, nonetheless, maybe for another video. Thanks for watching.